you know what you want to study? We'll uh, pray over it and see what the Lord will lead. I prefer to study a book of the Bible on Sunday nights. But... So we're in Revelation 18, 4 through 8. And uh, if you're ready for the Word of God, would you signify that by saying Amen? amen. Revelation 18, 4 is as follows. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you share in her thin sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. In the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges, judges her. Thank you. You can be seated. So, uh, we began this 18th chapter uh, last week, and we're discussing, discussing, yeah, discussing, the judgment of the city of Babylon and, in turn, the entire world system of the Antichrist. And remember, we've broken this, uh, this 18th chapter into seven sections, seven aspects of the judgment of Antichrist um, empire. Last week, we looked at the judgment pronounced. This week, we will look at the judgment avoided and the judgment defined and then we will continue on with the judgment lamented, the judgment enjoyed, judgment completed, and then the judgment justified. So we begin the section entitled Judgment Avoided. And there is a, a way for some then, according to what we read tonight, for some to avoid this impending judgment. We see that God's judgment on the commercially prosperous but morally corrupt society can in fact be avoided as our text says, another voice from heaven uh, states. And that voice, again we see, we see the Greek, Greek use of the Greek word here, alos, which means another of the same kind. So we have another angel. We had one in 18.1. Now we have another angel making another proclamation and this angel says, come out of her, my people. Okay. So, I think there has to be a, a certain level of conjecture on our part, what's being spoken of here. It would seem to be a call for God's people to distangle themselves from the world system. It could also be an evangelistic call to God's elect to come to the faith in Christ which is waiting for them and to come out of Satan's kingdom. In both instances though, the message is clear and the message is to abandon the system, get away from the system. Throughout the terrifying judgments of the tribulation, God will continue to, uh, to save people. Okay. Uh, the result of the gospel preaching of 144,000 evangelists result of the two witnesses, the angel flying around in mid-heaven will lead to the greatest harvest ever known in the history of evangelism. Many of those believers, we know, will be martyred for their faith in Christ when they refuse to receive the mark of the beast. There will be some survivors, though, and these survivors will face a powerful <coughs> temptation to participate in the world system. Family and friends who are members of the world system will now no doubt pressure them to save themselves by accepting the mark of the beast. Uh, the need for just the basic necessities of life will pressure some people to conform to the system. The exhortation that we read in Revelation is a lot like some of the Old Testament uh, exhortations when the prophets warned uh, people to flee from Babylon. Uh, in I, 
Isaiah 48, 20, it speaks, Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans. That's because of the impending doom of the ancient city Babylon. Jeremiah echoed Isaiah's warning in 50, uh, verse 8. He said, move, move from the midst of Babylon, go out of the land of the Chaldeans. And in 51, 6, he said, flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Further on in the 45th verse, he says, My people go out of the midst of her, and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Now, the warnings that are contained in these end time prophecies that we're reading in Revelation are not much different than present day warnings. We are told as God's people even today to avoid the temptation to get caught up in the world system. Okay? We are we are we are we are told we must avoid the temptation to get caught up in the world system. As Romans 12 2 reminds us, it says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing power of your mind that you may prove uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, part of which is written on the, the podium behind me. This is what Paul wrote of in his letter in 2 Corinthians when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. He told them, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness this comparison contrast. He, Paul always writes a comparison contrast. What fellowship, what, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part of, has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Okay, so he does all of those. For you, and then he, and then he clarifies it, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Now that, does, that doesn't mean to go move into a monastery. But, you know, a lot of people, a lot of religious people did that in the early centuries of Christianity. They went away and locked themselves up so that they could stay clean. That's not really what this is speaking of. This is speaking of you, 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 you have to be part of the world, but you cannot partake of the world. You have to be able to function in the world, but not, not function as part of the Understand what I'm trying to say. And does somebody, somebody have a better way to put that? Okay. Well, it's like a, sh a ship all over, and the world won't get inside of it unless uh, somebody opens the hatch. Okay. All right. Being in the world, not of the world. Being in the world and not of the world. Yeah, that's the, the good Southern Baptist version. So James wrote in 127, he said, Be pure. He said, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Remember what it is? Something about caring for widows and orphans. It's the orphans. Visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble. And he says to keep oneself unspotted in the Greek. It means to clean yourself off. To be unspotted from the world. Okay? Don't let the world get on you. The residue of the world. Later in 4.4, James writes, he says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That means to be God's en enemy. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. All right? So, and this biblical truth, now in this end times, this biblical truth, uh, you know, Believers that are not that are not to be involved in the world system, that, that idea is going to take on a new urgency to these people. 
as Babylon faces this, uh, this imminent destruction, you know, the angel's message to believers that are still in that city, city is the same one that the angels brought to Lot. Remember what the angels told Lot in Genesis, back in Genesis 19, I think it is. Get out before you get caught up in what's going to happen here. Flee because God is going to judge this wicked place. That's a paraphrase, but that's essentially what the angels told them. Pardon me? What happened? <laughs> you cannot go back and relive my jokes. Oh, they are unrelivable. <laughs> Good job, John. <laughs> I almost repeated this morning's joke, and I should. So you're going to get me in trouble. Believers are to flee Babylon. Our text says it says, "Lest you share in her sins." That's an interesting phrase. Lest you share in her sins. See, Babylon will be the most materialistic place. It will be the most pleasure-mad place. We've already talked about it, that it will be demon-infested. It will be all of those things rolled into one. And those things, pleasure, uh, materialism, demon infestation, will cause, it'll be, it'll be very tough on people to maintain their faith. So, the best thing, uh, 1 John 2.16 describes what, what, what befalls us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So it's, it'll be important for these believers to get away. Because I do think there'll be a, some knowledge on the part of the demons that, uh, that there's a great battle to ensue. And I think they'll be trying to win every convert they think that they can win. So God's people must uh, also, it says, flee because so they do not receive of her Babylon, Babylon's plagues. Now some people will, will see that as a reference to all the bold judgments. The, they're called plagues, okay? And the, but the thing about the bold judgments is that they are worldwide in nature in their scope. Hence, I don't think there would be, if, if, the, if, the, if the angel is telling them to flee to safety, there will be no place of safety because of the bold judgments worldwide influence. Therefore, I think this is a specific plague that is specifically attuned to Babylon. And I believe probably that it's the seventh bowl of judgment. It's the very end of, of those plagues as uh, I believe Babylon will fall at that time. And finally, it says for believers in our, te in our text that they must flee Babylon because her sins have reached to heaven. And that's an interesting phrase that... The New King James is a little weak in the translation. A better translation there would be the New American Standard. In the New American Standard, it says, Her sins have piled up as high as heaven. Now, what does that remind you of? The power of Babylon. Her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And that Greek word that's, uh, that's translated... In the New King James, is reached and piled up in the New American Standard is the word koleo. In the Greek, it's koleo. And what it means is to glue together, to stack on top of each other, to join together. So, I like to think of the idea that it's as if Babylon's sins will pile up, pile up like a new tower of Babel. But unlike the ancient tower, this time her sins will reach all the way to heaven. She will be so sinful, it will be as if her sins reach all the way to heaven. And the angel then adds, God has remembered her iniquities. And again, God will take note of them as he did, once did with the past arrogant, sinful uh, rebel rebellion at Babel. So God, say, have you... Okay, so God is going to remember their iniquities. Do you know how fortunate you are that God does not remember our iniquities? We're really fortunate. Isaiah 43, 25. I will not remember your sins. Man, that's a, that's a get out of jail free card here. So for the defining...
die in ba unrepentant Babylon, there will be none, uh, no forgiveness for her. There will only be judgment. Okay? So judgment, a void is a sub subject, and it really could be said judgment can't be avoided. So let's look at the definition of the judgment. We see Babylon's judgment. Is there any questions in, or comments in the first section tonight? Anybody? Yes, Cheryl. Yeah, God doesn't remember our enemies. Why do we? Huh? Why do we remember our God doesn't? Because we don't know. Because we. Mm -hmm. You're going to get me on another whole subject here. Okay. But that's okay. Because we want to. We want the sadness. Well, we, we oftentimes we're comfortable in our inequities. They comfort us. Because Satan has sold us a false bill of sale. So we believe that we. You know, you have no legitimate right to hold yourself guilty for something which God has forgiven you. But people do it all the time, especially men. Men are very good at holding themselves guilty for things which they have no... Not, they, they, not only shouldn't they, they have no legitimate right to hold on to those feelings of guilt. God has given them freedom and victory over them. They want to hang on to them. We're talking Christians here. <coughs> yes, we are. We are talking Christians. Yeah, the, the sinners. You know. Well, isn't that the devil? The, the freedom, the guilt, the, the sins? Well, it's a temptation, yeah. yeah. It's what we talked about in Sunday school. Today. I think he brings doubt that you don't deserve anything. Oh, yeah. Like that. yeah. And, uh, think of all the bad things you did. Yeah. Think of how you treated those people. Think of what you took from that person. Think of what this, think about that, think about this. But come back at him and say, according to what the scripture says, I'm going to forgive you. But it is written. Amen. God forgives us of all of our sins. Yes, Gordy. Uh, C.S. Lewis spoke about this, about uh, having both the saved and the damned living together on this earth. Yeah. And that uh, those that are saved, even their past remembers to start taking on a heavenly quality as they remember their forgiveness. And where I was the bad, those that are bound to hell just simply conform to the badness that they were already born into. Yeah, the problem. And some people will say that's the proper way to address and get over. Uh, the recurring guilt of your iniquity is to dwell on the forgiveness that was given to you because of that iniquity. The action by which God forgave you of that sin. And if you can begin to more dwell on that end of the iniquity mm -hmm. rather than on the iniquity itself, then you can sometimes rid yourself of those things. But there's it's Christians I go... The promises. If but, I confess my sin. But there are Christians, I have known Christians, who have been Christians for 50, 60 years, that have still not forgiven themselves of things that they did before they knew the Lord. That's ridiculous. I think yes, of it how is. sorrowful God must have felt, because I know how sorrowful I am when my kids, kids have done something that made me sad. Look what I've done to him to make me sad. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we're looking at the, the, the definition of the judgment on uh, Babylon. So we see judgment, uh, Babylon's judgment defined as the angel now speaks. Uh, and who does the angel speak to now? He speaks no longer to John. The angel's now talking to God. That's kind of an important part to know. And he calls for vengeance on Babylon. And the angel says to God, render to her just as she rendered to you. Okay. In these words, they kind of remind me of uh, way back in Revelation 6 when we were looking at the prayer of the martyred saints, remember? In 6, 9, and 10 it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, which is a phrase that it, those are sinners, not believers. Okay. So uh, kind of the same thought there between the two. So the angel's prayer there here then is a 
call for justice, and that call for justice is based on an Old Testament principle known as Lex Talionis. Have you ever heard of Lex Talionis? Lex Talionis. Lex is law. Talionis is retaliation. It's the law of retaliation, which is often misquoted by uh, believers or non-believers who try to uh, jade the word of God. It's the law of uh, retaliation is the idea an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which is mentioned several times in, in uh, scripture, but in Latin it's called lex talionis. And uh, Babylon has been extended enough grace. Babylon has been warned enough times. It is now for time for the law of retaliation to take effect. The time has come, in our outline the word will be for vengeance. It is time for Babylon's destruction. And again, we can look in the Old Testament and see the, the prophets uh, pleas for vengeance against ancient Babylon. In Psalm 137.8 it, it's written, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Jeremiah says in 51.24, And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. And later in that same chapter, verse 56, Because the plunderer comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, every one of her bows, bows is broken, for the Lord is the God of recompense, and he surely will repay. So it's important to note that retaliation, in your outline the word is retaliation, belongs to God and God alone. We don't get to retaliate. That's kind of sad, but... Vengeance is not to say that's right. I like that retaliation idea. But the Bible explicitly forbids Christians to take their own vision, the vengeance. Believers must, it says, uh, they... They shall not repay evil. We're not to worry about repaying evil. Instead, we are to wait for the Lord, and it says He will save them. Yeah. Because if you're a Christian, and someone does you evil, and you repay them with evil, what does that say about Christians? That you're, they're just like everybody else. Yeah. So you've got, to, you've, got to, uh, you've got to let God work through the process. And maybe by your forgiving their evil, Forgiving their evilness, you'll 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 help them come to know the Lord. Amen. First uh, Thessalonians five fifteen teaches that Christians are to. It says, "See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone." It says, "But always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all." But don't confuse all those pro prohibitions on. Uh, taking uh, action against people, you know, God has a, the Holy God has a legitimate right to, do, to, to render his wrath on those that don't believe him, and he will, okay? That type of uh, retaliation is not prohibited. So the angel says, he tells, he, the angel asks that God repay her double according to her works, okay? And in the Greek, what that really says is double the double things. It's like that old experiment commercial. Remember that? Double your pleasure, double your fun. This isn't pleasure or fun. Double the double things. And that is a request that Babylon's punishment, which the angel said, the angel wants the punishment to fit the crime. And the angel is seven, saying her crimes are double, punish her double. That's the intent behind the words. Double has been her iniquity, thus double must be her punishment in your outline. So Babylon's sins have flown over, uh, overflow. They've been piled up as high as heaven, heavens, and the angel calls for God's judgments to uh, overflow her in equal measure. And that, you know, when you think of that word double, you think of, you know, something's full, but if it's double, it's 
double full. It's, it, there's a completeness to it. And if you re remember all the way back to Mosaic Law, there's a lot of doubling in Mosaic Law where you have to pay double restitution for the crimes you commit. Exodus 24.2 says, If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, it's talking about an animal, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a, she a sheep, he shall restore double. If you've got one ox, you have to give back two. Later in verse 7, If a man delivers to his house money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. God's a double, uh, uh, God's into that idea of double the payment. So the prophets noted that Israel, and Israel, Israel, did you know Israel received double for all her sins according to the word of God? And that nations received double for their sins. Did you know that? They received double recompense. So, further stating his request, that God fully punish Babylon, the angel asks that, he says, in the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. And it's kind of fitting that the very cup that, this is the cup that Babylon used to deceive the nations, and she's about to receive a double portion of God's wrath. And the imagery of that cup we've already studied back in 14, 10, 16, 19. <coughs> And the angel then again calls a third time. Uh, the angel really wants uh, retaliation. And a third time, the angel says to enact uh, complete, uh, the, idea of, the, the idea is complete ven vengeance. It says, in the meantime, in the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same manner as she has done those things, he says, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. That's how confident, that's how presumptuous she is. In the, me in the measure is a call to match again the punishment to the crime, a biblical principle. And there, there are three sins that are noted in that, in that little section of scripture there that, she, that call for Babylon's punishment. First, she has glorified herself. Who's supposed to be glorified? God takes it serious when anything else is glorified. So, Isaiah 42, 8. I will not give my glory to another, God says. Remember this, folks. God hates pride. He's not impressed at all with our pride. And that is what not glorifying God is. Not glorifying God is the definition of pride on our part. The second Thing, uh, Babylon is guilty of. She's pursued self-gratification. She has lived luxuriously. Some uh, versions will say sensuously. And uh, the Bible pronounces death on those uh, that live that way. 1 Timothy 5.6 it says, But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. If you get over enamored with that pleasure, that luxury, then you find yourself already dead before you're actually dead. And then the third thing Babylon is guilty of is self-sufficiency. She presumptuously overestimates her power when she says, I'm a queen, I am no widow, and I will not see sorrow. That's someone that thinks that they will last forever. And the proud boast echoes that the same kind of thing we see back in Isaiah 47, 7. It says, I will be a queen forever. I will not sit as a widow. No, 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 no loss of my children. Almost exactly the same words. From ancient Babylon to the new Babylon. So God's devastating reply in Isaiah verse 9 in 47 is, but these two things shall come to you in a moment in one day. The loss of all your children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments. Speaking of uh, her uh, religious persuasion. And so, so for the three sins in Revelation, Babylon is going to receive, our text says, it says, death and mourning. 
The word death that we have there in the Greek is basanismos, basanismos. And basanismos means literally in Greek to torture. Torture and mourning, okay? Uh, and that's a pretty good description of hell. The torment of hell. To be separated from God. To understand that you had the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you threw that opportunity away. And now to understand for eternity that you will never have that opportunity again. Kind of a, an apt description. Uh, unimaginable torment. And really, psychologically, the true torment of hell will be in the mind. It will be psychological. It will be crushing in its grief. So after cataloging the sins, the angel says, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, indicating that she will be wiped out, resulting in this death and mourning. And Babylon's destruction, so Babylon's not going to be destructed uh, progressively. The city will be destroyed instantly. It will happen in a flash. Daniel 5, 5 speaks of a similar fate for the ancient Babylon. Remember, in ancient Babylon, the city fell the very night that God did what? On the very night that God wrote on the wall that it's doom, on that night, the city fell. So, as we've noted before, the plagues that will de destroy Babylon, I believe, are specific judgments on that specific city. Again, I think connected to the seventh bowl judgment. And Babylon will experience, it says, three plagues in this instantaneous condition as she is completely devastated, death, mourning, and famine, which is, and it says she will be utterly burned with fire. And, you know, a lot of people see nuclear warfare, uh, the possibility of nuclear warfare as a lot of the destructive force that is uh, evidenced in the book of Revelation, and I, I don't uh, I don't take away from that idea. Uh, I'm kind of neutral on it. I figure God knows what he's going to do and how he's going to do it, but it could be a, a description of that type of uh, doom. So Babylon's doom is certain and cannot be avoided. Why? It says, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. One thing about God, you're not going to frustrate his plan. You're not going to keep him from accomplish, accomplishing what it is his end goal is. When God has a purpose, he will fulfill that purpose. Job said to God in 42.2, this is what Job said after this long interaction. And Job, when he got all the way to the end of his uh, story, Job had intense personal knowledge of who God was. Okay? He said in 42.2, he said, I know that you can do everything. And that, uh, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. That's what Job had to say about God. That is what Proverbs 21 or 19.21 speaks of. It says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that is what will stand. And it says, Nebuchadnezzar said when he was chastened and humbled by God, and he said in Daniel 4.35, God does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God does what God wants to do. And all the power of all the wicked men in Babylon, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all the demons who will be gathered in that one city will not be enough to deliver Babylon from God's judgment. And that's the judgment as it is defined. Okay. That's it. Questions?